Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Okay. Just let's have this starting. Okay, so today, no celebrations allowed, though, it's our last lecture. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're going to, last year, obviously, because of the outbreak of the pandemic and stuff, we couldn't actually go through uh, too many things related to, to our planet. And but looking at our planet in a scientific manner it's the way the only way we can have to understand how it works so today we're going to look at some of the principles that we actually saw applied in several other contexts and uh, we'll try to understand a bit about our planet how it works so we we'll try to condense in a couple of hours that we don't have today what we were supposed to do and to finish last year that uh, unfortunately we could not because i think we met once or twice uh, in total last year um, but i'm trying to uh, re-condense and recap uh, everything and uh and maybe who knows next year we'll just dedicate it we'll be just dedicating to this so our planet it's uh kind of uh, unique in the solar system and uh, the solar system uh, originated uh, several uh years ago millions of years ago so everything started from a nebula which was a slow spinning cloud of gases and dust into the space so we have this kind of material that about five thousand million years ago so if we look uh, even at the numbers it's incredibly uh, high uh, this nebula uh, began to collapse and this is due to the gravitational forces acting. So everything was forced to collapse. So by collapsing, and we saw some other uh, examples in the conservations of energy and so on, but it started to shrink and spinning therefore faster, faster and faster. And this nebula became and spinning this with large of a uh, large amount of material at the center okay what does it do and uh, as a other consequence as an effect of this phenomenon as a consequence of this phenomenon the center becomes very hot okay and therefore uh, nuclear fusion and some uh, phenomenon started to begin okay out in the outer region the disk gradually condensed so uh in the we start having solid particles that were actually get together forming small bodies okay that's what the initial stage of our uh, of our planets, right? 
and um, therefore we don't have this kind of objects, this kind of material growing as planet. And if we look at time scale, we are setting around 4,500 4, million years ago. Okay, so even for doing this, if we go back and look to 5 million years ago, and 4,500 4, million years ago, in order to have this simple, let's say, mechanism, uh, we had to spend about 500 million years, which is something that I don't think we, need, we can even imagine as a number, right? It's not easy to touch and to have an idea how long uh, it is. But uh, we can definitely say and understand that it's very long, huge. And uh, again, if we compare even with the humans being around, it's basically like proportionally, we have been less than seconds on our planet in respect to the long life uh, of the system. This is just a kind of picture uh, summary of uh, what happened. So what we just saw in terms of sentences, it's summarized in here in, um, uh, in pictures. We do have our initial, initial stage, then they start to shrink, getting hotter, and then the uh, sun is forming at the, big, at the center, and then masses are start accumulating and rotating around the sun, orbiting around the sun because of gravity, and finally we get the shape of the solar system that we have today. Okay, yeah. yes, of course. Yeah, more, one day, yes. So you were saying if uh, the solar system is gonna stay there forever, or eventually one day it will die. Yes, one day it will. Maybe we will be not live. We are not going to live enough to actually see it because it's going to take millions of years to. But yes, uh, it will. Uh, it will evolve. And this life, it's also related to the life of the sun. That one day will change its its uh, um, shape. It will consume all the material to be transformed that actually is giving us energy and uh, therefore the solar system our solar system will get another part now how there there are several stars right the sun is one of them it's our precious and precious uh, star because it's the closest that we have and to which we are uh linked because the the way we we as a system developed life on the planet but there are like several other solar systems out there and uh, and the universe is uh, actually uh, immense and populated by several stars and several of them they have solar systems similar to our at least in terms of uh, shape and um, if we stick with our solar system and we stay um, just close or whatever it means being close, we do have in our solar system several planets, okay? That's how they are in order. And this picture is almost to scale. So this red stuff and orange stuff that we see on the left-hand side is actually a portion of the sun. So the sun is much, much bigger than the others, okay? Our planet is deterred in sequence as a distance, considering the distance from uh, the sun. And uh, we do have the first four planets in the order of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And Mars is actually on the Chronicles in these days because of new instruments sent uh, uh, send there. Um, 
those are called terrestrial planets. Those are rocky planets, and they are smaller in size than uh, than the others. While the other four are Jovian um, planets, they are made mainly of gases, and they're called uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, uh, Neptune, and then there is another little one over here, which is Pluto, that actually was declassified and was uh, and is not considered a planet anymore. Now, all the all the planets they orbit around the sun on an orbit which is almost on the same plane okay so if you think the sun over here they go like this what they have is different time of orbiting around the sun and orbiting even um, in respect to their own axis while pluto is which is the last one is not actually orbiting like this on the same plane as the others but is orbiting like this, but it's a little bit tilted, the plane where it's orbiting, okay? But besides that, like, um, it's a, an object that belongs to our solar system. Now, if we look in terms of numbers or in terms of mass in just looking at our solar system so the eight slash nine planets if we are going to consider pluto or not we can see already from this statement that it's irrelevant right and uh, and the sun on its own makes up over 99 percent of the total mass into the solar system okay the, terrenal, the terrestrial planets are made up, as we said, of rock, uh, mostly silicates, and we will see something later on, and metals, so heavy objects, okay? Um, uh, while the gas planets, so the four and the big one in respect to uh, their um, diameter that we saw in the previous picture, are mainly made up of hydrogen and helium, okay? And uh, eventually also their compounds like water, ammonia, and, uh, and stuff similar to this. So we can actually see, and even if we cannot touch or feel the difference, but we can anticipate what th that they will have different, uh, different conditions, right? And... Um, Okay, that's we already explained the last statement about the directions and the planar uh, motion that they have. Now, let's forget about the other planets, which are nice and it's okay, but let's have a look at uh, our planet, the place where we live. Okay, so the Earth is not a uniform body. It has a uh, distinct region and it can be divided in several layers. We already mentioned this uh, some time ago, I believe, but we will, we will see uh, again. Um, at the beginning, when we say that all this dust, this material orbiting around the sun was starting to form, um, let's say this kind of material was somehow uniform, homogeneous, okay? But as times went by, heat was actually generated. Gravitational compression was still acting and compression was, force it, was forcing all this material to actually come together, okay? Uh, some material became to melt. The molten and heavy objects basically were forced to move and to sank towards the center. And um, Earth, about 4,200 million years ago, was actually differentiated and 
different materials were stratified, let's say, at different depths, obviously looking at the diameter of the planet, that, of, uh, that for the record, it's more than 6,000 kilometers. The Earth is more than 6,000, 6,300 kilometers, um, considering its uh, radius. Okay, so the radius of the planet is about 6,300 kilometers. So in this particular case, when we when I mention stratification, I mean the main layers that actually were forming. Okay. If we consider the differentiation of the planet, that's the results that we do had, and that's what we have in terms of um, the different stratum. Okay. We do have a core, an internal part of the core, which is mainly made by iron, okay, and which is the internal part, is very hot, still it's able to produce radioactive decay, and uh, transferring energy and heat to the external part, what we call the mantle, okay, and from here to here, it's about 3,000 kilometers, okay? And this mantle is made up of melt and rot, and exactly in the same mechanism that we saw a um, few lectures ago, where we were looking at the convection motion, the heat coming from the core is heating up the mantle, and the down part of the mantle, this part, will be eating up, okay? So became less dense and start to rise, like the water example that we did and the water, the water in a pan that, uh, that we did, okay? This rise up gets up to the surface where it becomes a little bit colder and then start to sink, okay? Because it's colder, heavier, and, uh, and then goes down, gets to the uh, close to the source of it again, and this keep. <laughs> good, good question. It's hot. It's hot. Yeah, okay, but you have to consider that iron melts at around 2000 degrees Celsius, okay? No, 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 absolutely. But it's, uh, it, let's put it this way, it's quite hot. <laughs> Exactly, but what happens is that actually what we get from lava is not what's coming or what's coming from here. What we get from the lava, it's what's coming from the upper part of the mantle, okay? So that are all of those are melting rocks, okay? So some of these rocks then are melting, melting and then because of some phenomenon or some uh, particular things, they are rising up and reaching the surface. Once they reach the surface, we don't have the actual crust where we do live on, okay? And uh, they solidifies because they uh, became colder. Correct, exactly. That's correct. In fact, we're going to see some of this on the tectonic plates motion in uh, a couple of slides. Yes, Etna, it's Etna or any volcanic, volcanic islands that we don't have. It's the result of this kind of phenomenon. So they, the planet inside is allow me to use this word, it's not the precise one and the right one, but it's actually a moving object, it's a living object, right? 
And what we see at the surface is the results of this dynamic situation that there is inside, in which the main driving factor is the eat produced at the center of the planet. So if tomorrow we do have a switch and we go at the center of the planet and then just switch off and we don't have that eat developing inside the planet and then be transferred to the mantle and therefore to the crust, our planet will take a different path. Okay, because of course we are not going to have plate tectonics, we are not going to have uh, any volcanism anymore, we're not going to have any earthquakes anymore. And believe it or not, besides the catastrophic results that they can cause locally, okay, or even globally in some cases, and I will give you a couple of examples. Um, um, so besides this aspect, actually, this kind of phenomenon are shaping up our planet. Our planet has the shape external part, even because of this. And we will see some examples. So the, the fact that we do have mountains, particular cliffs, uh, volcanic islands, and so on, is the result of all of this. So the planet is evolving with it and thanks to that. But we will see some pictures as we go along. Yes, and uh, but we will uh, get into that because the mechanism of that one we will discover it's a little bit different from the Etna one, and we will see and we will see why. Not, but rightly so, as you said, that one is the most active, and but not of the volcanoes are exactly the same. They depend on the tectonic regime. They depend on several content and the results that they do have. Yes, there are like several, and um, even the type of lava that they can, uh, that we can observe at different locations is not always the same. And the volcanic activity is not always the same. It depends on several chemical factors and physical factors. In fact, in the Hawaiian lava, we don't have this kind of flow and uh, kind of river-like lava flow, right? If we move to um, the Vesuvio area, that is a completely different story, right? We do have a, a kind of big cup holding everything, and when the activity is strong enough, then this will explode, and we know what happens to Pompeii uh, about 2000. No. Yes, but... <clears throat> yes, but yes, but that uh, the Maltese islands are not volcanic, are sedimentary. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it exploded. It's the volcano exploded. And the fragment, the one that they were. Yeah, no, those, that's another story. But yes, but in, yes, but yes, yes, but in general. No, 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 but in, yes, but in general, all the Maltese rocks are sedimentary. So, big. They've been transported, that's another story, but they have been transported and they, re yes. 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 Uh, that one was in 2002, the big one. 
or 2003? Yes, the pomes. Grayish and floating. Yes. Yes, those are float because they do have. Yeah, but then because then they will get um, 2003. The this because but actually that happens that big landslides happens because um, as a result and triggered by the volcanic activity because during that years it has deep size and during that activities. Yes, exactly. Now you have the big landslide. Yes, the big landslide that actually went into the sea. Yes, because that's a lot of water that is uh, a lot of mass that is coming into the water and then transferring the energy from this mass to the water and then starting uh, that to move. But that's in the tsunami generation of things. But it can uh, it can be associ exactly associated with this. Yes, and in fact, we're going to have a couple of pictures now, or sketch. And yes, it did in the past, it can do it again, right? And um, now, let's go back on track, and we will go to the Vesuvio um, later on. But the, the oldest rock that we uh, believe that, and we had found it's dated a little bit more than 4,000 million years old and has been found in Canada. Okay. So, if we want to have uh, a look at uh, some numbers and just uh, compare in terms of pressure and temperature, because there are two uh, physical. Um, concepts that we explored quite a while during this um, this class. If we look at the Earth's core, um, we can literally say that it's very hot, right? It's above 5,000 uh, Celsius degree. Um, and even though iron in general, melts around 2,000, 2,000 something um, uh, Celsius, degree Celsius, it's still solid at this temperature because of the enormous pressure. At that depth, we don't have the pressure, just, uh, um, let's say, uh, we do have a pressure that is about 3 million times the atmospheric pressure because it's due to the weight of all the rocks or all the material that are above. It's like when we go diving, if we go 10 meters down, 20 meters down, we do have every 10 meters, one atmosphere more, right? Because we do have, hmm? yes, and which in total is two, but the 10 meters of water correspond to the equivalent of one atmosphere, because we actually are subject to the load and the weight of the water above us. And that's exactly the same in here, okay? Um, okay, that's, we can skip this and we go directly at looking at some numbers, okay? And after this, now we'll try to understand how we can date things. How can we tell that something is older than something else? But in general, we know, like, let's get our timeline. Now, we said that the oldest rock, it's around 4,200 million years ago. It was the one that we mentioned found in Canada. And early forms of life appeared into the oceans 3,800 million years ago. Okay, so almost 500, 500 million years of difference, okay? Then we had to wait more than 1,000 million years, which actually it's, you know, quite huge, 
to actually develop plants in ocean. Okay, this was an important milestone because they started capturing some of the bad gases that are not useful for the life in the way it has been uh, developed. Suppose so, the, like, see. Yes, and they were already here, see? And the firm form of life into the oceans appeared like about 3,800 million years ago. Then this we will start organizing in more complex uh, structures, living objects, then slowly became plants. The plants then started to produce oxygen by incorporating CO2, that the uh, atmosphere has not been constant through the life of the, in terms of composition, through the life of the planet, right? Because uh, water, actually, we do believe, and there are like some other um, planets having water, right? And, huh? No, but we do have also a kind of um, apparently almost unique set of balance, right? Which is given by several factors. The fact that we do distance from the sun, the atmosphere, like it's, um, and the atmosphere is also protecting us, kind of the size of the planet. There are a lot of inverted commas, magical factors that actually, and coincidences that actually made our planet be evolving in the way that we do have. And, and there, yes, right place and right time, <laughs> most probably. Yes, exactly. And, um, Okay. Yes. Now I will I will show you like uh, this is like a graph with all some of the important milestones of the even life uh, life on Earth. Right. Now, obviously, when we talk about life. Yes, but now also let me allow to make this personal comment. This, uh, even when we talk about life, we need to consider uh, that we are thinking of the on life in the way we actually observe life. Okay, so. On our planet, conditions were right enough and good enough to allow life to grow as it is, which is based on a good equilibrium of several gases, oxygen uh, and water and carbon are the main elements that we need to consider when we look at the life. But there are some bacteria, for example, that even though uh, they live on this planet, they live in some particular conditions in which this conceptual way that we do have of our life doesn't apply because they are based on some other elements. Their life is based on some other elements. Okay? Um, so we need to um, always keep things in mind and to have a kind of reference system where to place ourselves. Yes, uh, but uh, all of these are like uh, big hypotheses, 
the yes, and the only way is actually go and explore them. Now that's what we started. When we say we, when I say we, obviously as a human beings uh, on Mars. No, now I just repeat the question for just for the for the sake because we're recording, okay? So um, the in the past the dinosaurs at a certain point got extinct, not because of the actual balance that changed into the oxygen on the atmosphere, even though the atmosphere at that time was different from the atmosphere that we have to that we have today but because there was a huge big impact of a meteorite on the planet and um, that changed the environmental condition all of a sudden okay the temperature of the planet dropped Exactly, the temperature of the planets dropped. The sunlight had more difficulties to penetrate this big mass of dust uh, creating, that was created. And uh, therefore, this type of life got extinct. Some of them and some other animals actually resisted and kept going with, in the evolutionary adventure. Of course, this is something that in which time and patience <laughs> somehow are the driving factors, right? And we do have several species that are endemic in one particular region uh, that actually evolve differently by adapting to the environment. So it's true that we don't have milestones okay and important milestones in the life in the evolution of life it's darwin's theory it's a exactly adaptation to change and uh, and adaptation to change in uh, of life to that particular conditions right it's happening even now we will see uh, from one of the sketches that i do have somewhere down the line that the Maltese islands are quite young okay but we do have some particular form of lives that are developing and that developed differently because they stayed isolated on filfla fungo, fungus rocks and uh, so we do have few little in that particular case i'm referring to endemic lizards reptiles that are that have been kept isolated and the Maltese islands we will see from the timeline they are very very young okay we are younger than the dinosaurs okay and that's that's the reason why we don't have dinosaurs or fossils of dinosaurs all around uh, but still being that a small amount of time they actually evolved and are evolving in a different manner to respect to the others why australia they don't have um, some animals that are not found anywhere else because it has been isolated kept isolated for quite a long time and they develop with adaptation to that particular environment okay Yes, pollution, exactly. That's, that's the main problem that actually scientists are discussing now. Exactly, because there is a balance. And this balance, it's always restored or kept through a large amount of time. Now, this adaptation needs time. And what scientists actually are arguing now and no one is questioning the actual increase of temperature what actually are we are arguing and 
is not that in the past we didn't have any change in temperature or any change in uh, environmental conditions, even gas contents and stuff. But it's the impact of the human beings okay, on planet Exactly. And the fact that has been drastically helping in accelerating some process. So don't give in time to the adaptation. Okay. Uh, of course, then we talk about natural disasters. Then in my, I, it's a term that I personally, even if I use it sometimes, I don't fully agree with. Okay. Because actually, we are, it's not a natural disaster. It's a human disaster, right? <laughs> because obviously we get a lot of disasters or problems just because we are interacting, right? With that, if we, with the, with the planet and we are contributing to reshaping the planet, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, that's that can happen and yeah actually yes the fact that we don't have salinity into the water it's and we don't have like fresh water just fresh water it's uh, a kind of a complex phenomenon but can be explained um let's say simply by considering that the water are accumulating into depressions of the planet right at a lower level fine like that right and but new water is always coming in and we do know that rivers and everything is dragging water new water into these big depressions right but rivers also carry results of the journey of the water because while water is actually being transported due to gravity from one place to another actually is eroding several materials is dissolving several elements uh, presence into the rock and those are brought into the water that eventually will all those elements will start to dissolve and give this salinity flavor let's call it this way to the water there are places on earth and in general the salinity is not the same all over it might change there are places on earth and the dead sea is one of them in which the salinity is higher okay i i don't remember how much how many times is higher than normal sea uh, I think it's even something more, but I'm not sure. So, oh yes, and because that sea got trapped, okay. So the saline then evaporation obviously kept going, and the salinity start to increase because we do have a less volume. And in that particular conditions, life cannot generate it because it's like the salt is too much to have any form of life to, uh, to develop. Yes, there are, there are. 
No, there would there could be a contribution of some gases coming up and interacting, but the main reason is because it has been an enclosed. Yes. No. Yes, I did. Yes, originally, yes. And uh, but then when we talk about water, we do have some other things dissolved into it. And and then we do have, in fact, we notice that even like looking at the labels into the into the water, we do have several elements dissolved, right? And we know, for example, that if we do place some elements into the water. It's an experiment that we do all the time with salt, right? <laughs> the salt vanishes, right? But, excuse me? Yes, of course, but that's uh, that's the extra little flavor and extra little input that human beings are putting into it, okay? Mars? It's similar. It's like the closest. It's the closest. It's a dry, it's a dry planet. There is a lot of things that we need to discover on it as well. Yes, but it can depend on uh, several factors. Now, for example, during the last mission on Mars, they start to de to deploy even some seismometers, okay, to actually try to identify if there is any earthquake activity on the planet. And apparently, it seems that it has it has some uh, earthquake activity. Why? We need to because that's the only way through seismometers and through earthquakes that we can study the internal uh, part of the of the earth or in this particular of uh, planet of the mars in this particular case they are actually rightly called mars quake not earthquakes no it's the next one in line so it's the fourth one okay and uh, of course this con this if there is um, uh such of things yes it's uh, similar it's uh, rocky and uh no uh, uh, the no because the four uh, external planets are gases okay and they can yes but uh, the sun, it's just made of uh, hydrogen and it's a star, okay? It's not a planet, okay? So it's able to generating and to burn uh, material and to transform that material in something else and this in something else. And this transformation is releasing energy. And that's energy is then it's traveling and getting to, to our um at our location let's say okay so now i would like to try to see what are the methods that we can use for actually saying and dating things okay so what we call radiometric dating okay that will help us to understand the age of the planet or the age of several um, rocks into the planet. Okay, we do have two way of uh, giving an estimate of the age of something, right? Either through comparisons or in, absolute, in an absolute manner, okay? Through comparisons, I can tell or we can tell from a certain kind of observations that my age is different from someone else's age, right? And I can compare my 
uh, physical features, let's say, to the one with my daughter. And I can tell, or we can tell, that I'm older than she is, right? But that's, I cannot tell precisely how older I am, okay? I can just say that I'm older than this other person, or I'm younger than this other person, okay? That's a kind of uh, uh, something that we compare, and on, in the geological time, we do this through the fossils. So we know that some fossils are older than others, and through what we call the geological sequence, with the principle of having younger layering always on top. So ideally, like in archaeology, the more we dig, back the more back in time we go okay same kind of approach when we look at fossils and rocks however there are some um, methods radiometric dating that will give us an absolute age okay in the previous examples with me and my daughter the radiometric dating it's an actual a scientific method that will look at some particular features. In the case of me and my daughter, would be, let's say, obviously in this silly example, the ID card. I have a way to measure that into the ID card on that particular feature associated to my daughter, she was born, whatever, 2012, and I was born. 30 years earlier, okay? And I can say then that I'm, that she's 10 and I'm 40. We can do, we can actually do that in an absolute manner, okay? So the difference between the first and the second is that in the first case, we can tell it's younger than the others or older. In the other, it's an absolute manner how much we can quantify okay how do we do this again we bring uh, a model that we actually saw in several other concepts but at the end of the day our elements and our basic bricks of life for this uh, of um, uh, science in this particular context we can go even at a smaller scale than this but uh, uh, we don't consider it uh, it's made of an atom, it's made of an internal part, again, we said, with nucleus, which is uh, formed by protons and neutrons, and we do have charges, part charged particles orbiting around. Actually, we do have that the number of protons, okay, in uh, the nucleus determines the chemical element. So we do have, and we made this example, that hydrogen, we do have one proton in the nucleus. Helium, we do have two protons in the nucleus, okay? That's the two chemical elements. Hydrogen is different than helium, okay? And, uh, but we do have in some part in several uh, elements what we call isotopes. So that in the nucleus, except and not just the protons, we do have also neutrons. Okay, those are particles that they are not charged. So the protons are positive charged, and um, the neutrons they don't carry any electrical charge, but they are particles, they're there. And even though they are super tiny, they still weigh something. So if we do have one proton and another element, which is always hydrogen, because it has one proton, but has also a neutron, this is heavier than this one, because it has two particles, a new, new, neutron, and the proton. This one is just a, a, 
uh, just the proton. Now, chemical processes, they do, this, they do not distinguish between isotopes. That is always hydrogen from a chemical point of view. Okay? But uh, from a physical point of view, since the mass is different, some, the isotopes can have some particular features that we can use to actually date things. Okay? Let's try to see how it works. And before we go to this, uh, no. Okay. So in general, let's, uh, so in general, we do have this nucleus that contains protons and neutrons that could be unstable. Okay, what does it mean? That they have to transform in something more stable. The way they can transform, it's called radioactive decay. And it happens in three different ways. Okay? We call it like P and D, parents and daughter element. Okay? So the parents is our initial, the parent, and then daughter, it's something that this atom is evolving into. Okay? Don't ask me why they're called parents and daughter and not parents and son, but I have a daughter, so I like it, and I don't complain. But uh, in general, this evolved in something else, okay? That's what it says. So this, let's look at this, okay? This evolved in something different. You can see that the number of blue and red dots are different in numbers from parents to daughter, okay? Because some particles have been emitted. So some parts have been uh, released, okay? But this separation, let's call it this way, also emits energy, okay? So I have this, which is made by 10 elements, at the end of the process, I obtained something that is of eight elements and two spare elements. So the total is always 10. But the fact that has been separated, some energy went away. Okay? In some other cases, we do have the same kind of masses that stays. Okay? And there will be emission of just electrons, but this emission of electrons also involves release of energy. Um, or we could have, like this is the opposite, the case C is the opposite of uh, case uh, B. In this particular case, we do have the capture of an electron, okay? Now, what does it mean? that we measure, so we do have always a parent transforming in a daughter, in another element, okay? So the ratio, this is just for one atom, right? Into the matter, we do have a lot of those, okay? So the concentration of the parent's element, okay? and the transformation in the concentration of the daughter elements, it takes some time. We can measure this time and tell how old that stuff is because it has taken that certain amount of time to transform from P, parents, to the daughter element, okay? Now, let's look at this and allow me to make a silly example just to visualize okay again it's uh, it's an example that we use just to visualize this concept okay 20 years ago i had all my hair on my head completely black okay time is going by 20 years down the line the concentration if at the beginning I was in this situation, 
all my uh, air were black, like in this particular case. I have the concentration of my air, everything black, okay? Time goes by, nothing that we can do, right? But the concentration of my black hair is diminishing through time, right? And I do have several white hair here, right? The white hair, it's something, it's in this example, the daughter elements, okay? So the parents, the black one has transformed into the daughters, which are the white, okay? So I can eventually, we can tell that in these 20 years, I went from a certain concentration to another concentration. In 20 years time from now, when I will be 60, the concentration will be different. In other 20 years time, the concentration will be different. So along and down the line, after 60, 80 years, I will have more daughter elements, so more white air that I had 80 years earlier, right? It's something that we can observe. So if we can make a measurement of those, we can tell how old I am, okay? Obviously, usually women are cheating because they paint their hair, right? You're a seduction of cheating, though. <laughs> because, no, but joking apart. <laughs> Even men nowadays like are cheating a bit. But, but in general, the assumption is that a certain amount has transformed in some other. By observing this variation, we can tell how much time has passed today. Now, uh, obviously, in this particular context, now I was making a joke of the fact that my wife cheats on this, right? And um, but actually, that's a big assumption on on this particular um, subject because the big assumption is that at the beginning, when we start having this zero point we do have no daughter elements. If we do have daughter elements, we will be biased. It's like having cheating more or less white hair, okay? So in general, if we want to translate, uh, sorry, we feel this, it's what we have, time zero. After some times, we do have more daughter than parents, okay? Like we do have, and any step in between. Okay, that's if we want to translate in terms of graphs, the number of white, of black air on top of my head are decreasing, going, let's say, to zero. And at the beginning, I had zero white hair, right? And through time, the number of daughters, so the white hairs, are actually increasing. Okay, where they cross is what we call the half time. Okay, after half time of the of our in our case of my lifetime, I will have 50 50, and then why time has gone by, this 50 is decreasing or increasing as if we're looking at the black or the white hair. Huh? Yes, uh, just a little break, but. Let's see. This is what I meant before, okay? That we, if we do have at the beginning a certain elements that are not all parents, so our assumption is not verified, we can have age that is too old, okay? Like if at the beginning, there are like some people, like in that silly, silly example that we do have, there are like people that at the age of 20, they don't have their white their hair completely white or very close to it. Obviously, that's an exception in this. And, but if we don't 
carefully look at those things, obviously we get a bias. And we get that that guy is too old. He's actually 30 years old, but based on the observation, too many daughters, too many black, uh, white hair, we say, oh, you're 60. No. Okay? So we need to be uh, always uh, conscious of this. Now, and then we stop for the break. Uh, not all the elements, they decay at the same manner. So for different kind of elements, different kind of atoms, they evolve from parents to daughter through different times. So for example, carbon takes about 5,000, let's, let's round it up, 6,000 years to actually transform all the parents into daughters. And uh, radium, it will take 50 million years to actually modify from all parents to daughter, okay? So from this schematic uh, table, we can actually see that not all the elements are good for dating. So for dating rocks, we do need, we cannot use carbon, that actually is used mainly into the archaeology, the carbon dating, what they call the C14, okay? Just because it's after 6,000 years, there is nothing that we can observe. Everything is daughter, okay? But in the archaeology features, um, uh, environments, there, it's a feature that it's enough because we're looking at something that eventually soared, uh, I don't know, 500, 2,000 years ago, and it's okay. In order to date different type of rocks, we need different kind of elements. Up to this one that it's able to date very, very old rocks. Okay? Break? Okay. Yes. No, but that
Yes. <laughs> Quite quickly as well. Okay. So now that we know that we do have two methods for dating things, we can reorder our time scale and starting from the top, the bottom, uh, 4,600 million years ago, we scale up, up to the present day. This is what we call it a uh, geological time scale. So, and we don't have few milestones uh, here, okay? Now, the geological time scales is divided in era, period, and epochs. Um, as you can see in here, we do have uh, some of milestones that we saw. And let's say around 3,800 million years ago, we do have the uh, earliest fossil recorded, okay? And uh, the first land plants or the first fish, so kind of more complex uh, form of life, they happen to be around 500 million years ago. So in terms of number of years, we are, let's say, around 3,500 okay? uh, uh, million years. The first mammals on Earth happened, was around 200, let's say, 50 million years ago. So we are somewhere here. And the dinosaurs, finished to walk around about 60 million years ago, okay? And as you can see, we had to wait some 30 million years more to see actually the Maltese islands starting to form underwater, okay? Those it's formed underwater, Those, all the main geology features that we do have on the islands are sedimentary. So it means that underwater, several, like uh, the compactation of sands, um, even living objects, we do have a lot of fossils and shells into the compositions of our rocks. It start to sediment, to accumulate, to aggregate and to uh, solidifies in, uh, and then some other tectonic regimes happened. Early humans, we are around 1.5 million years ago coming um, uh, towards us, and we do have the finishing of the high age and uh, of the ice age, and by 0 0.01 million years ago, so basically yesterday, and then the uh, history, let's say, takes cover. And now what's interesting in here that as a period, we stop to the quaternary. What, with quaternary, we do have all the modern stuff, okay? They're quite young. And... Uh, but uh, now there's a big argument, I don't think it's accepted by everyone, that together with this epoch, we do have the Miocene, where the formation of the Maltese Islands, Pliocene, Pleistocene, uh, where the formation of the Maltese Islands actually took place. In recent and more recent, people are proposing, just this is just out of curiosity, to have a new epoch called Anthropocene, okay? So, as you can see, all these uh, different periods and epochs are marked by uh, important 
um, benchmarks, okay? The dinosaurs, in our particular case, the formation of our islands, the ice age, the first mammals, animals, plants, uh, and so forth. Now, since the human impact, apparently, it's such a strong, uh, has a such strong component into the evolution of the planet, people are uh, proposing to add this new uh, time, time stamp with and marking then the Anthropocene, so the footprint of uh, humans on the planet. Now, let's have a look at uh, some particular features of the planet. We already saw that we do have the core, inner and outer core, the mantle and the crust. And we mentioned as well that the planet, the crust, the external part, the colder and um, external part of the planet is actually fragmented. Yes, sir. Is it into the material and composition. Yes, there are there are two, um, and the and uh, so it's temperature and composition, physical composition, because one of them is liquid. Okay, it's in a in a liquid form, and uh, so going back to the plate, we said that our planet, our external part, the crust, is divided and fragmented in several plates. And those plates, because of the motion into the mantle, are actually dragged around and are moved around. So the interaction between the plates is actually creating earthquakes and uh, volcanic activities. Okay? Now, the most about... The most dangerous area, that is Eastern Mediterranean, but I don't know, and I think the Indonesian area, because that's clarified Yes, but uh, not in here. Yes, in here, but ev and now we'll see everywhere we do have the marking, the boundaries of the plates. Where there is population, yes. If something happens here in the middle of the sea, we don't care. It's just so far away from us, right? Yes. Uh, even this area, but even our uh, our places in the Central Mediterranean, of course, Japan and uh, South America and several other places. From the African, the in uh, African plate against the European plate. Yes, we will see this now. Exactly, even the exactly so basically, that's the actual picture, okay, of all these plates, and those are fragmented. We said the crust is fragmented, and those are the place where the interaction between the two plates occurs, okay, so it can interact in such a way that is constructive, we we'll say so, new crust is formed or destructive, like some crust is destroyed into the interaction because either the plates are colliding to each other or just moving apart. So again, this it's a picture of what we do have today, but some time ago, situation was different. This is a picture of what we had about 1000 million years ago the geography of our planet was completely different, okay? So we do have one just big continent that 450 million years ago, so certain good chunk of time has passed, evolved in uh, this supercontinent, okay? That's a picture that we do have 
around 200 million years ago, in which we start seeing delineating some of the uh, features that we see. We see Australia over here, India, this is the entire planet. So India now we know that is located in the Northern Hemisphere, but 200 million years ago, it was somewhere else, right? And this is Africa, this is South America. So they were actually together at once, okay? Why did it break up? Because let's not forget what we have on the mantle. We do have that the core is always transferring energy to the mantle. The mantle is moving through the convective uh, currents. So the parts close to the core is heating up, becoming hotter and go up. Once became hotter and go up, uh, it is far away from the uh, from the core and it gets cooler and it sinks again. So this motion like this is actually happening inside the uh, mantle. But if this is happening and we do have a rigid crust on top, here I do have currents that are moving the rigid crust on top. So they are start separating. And that's what happened in here. We do have currents underneath this portion and this portion that are for, as they're moving inside the planet, are forcing the stuff that is on top to actually move with it and separate it. Because we do have this rigid cup, okay, the crust. The, which is breaking apart and moving, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, this is, huh? Yes, but this is, uh, if you look at this, this is the Eurasia, this is North America, South Africa, 200 million years ago, this is uh, South America, sorry, Africa, Antarctica, India, that through time moved all the way up over here. At the same time, this was moving apart over here, this over here, even Africa was moving a little bit this way. Australia went uh, on its own far away and the Antarctica moved downwards into the actual position. Yes. Yes, but in a picture when it was a baby form 200 million years ago, okay? It was united, yes. <laughs> exactly. But, but in the future, of course, these things are still going on. In 200 million years ago, the geography that we have today would be most probably different, right? And so we do have three type of margins and that's what we have, okay? Let's, let's see. So in here, we do have the core down, okay? Then we do have our mantle here and we do have currents, they go this way over here and this way over here, okay? Like this. So in this particular context, the rigid part on top, it's forced to break, okay? To get thinner and break. But if it's breaking, getting thinner and breaking because the two portions are moving apart, okay? Uh, fluid material, these melted rocks are rising up and we do have formation of the oceanic ridge, a lot of volcanic activities over here, okay? That's what we call a divergent margins because the two plates are moving apart, they're thinning and magma is rising up, okay? But if we have at this location two plates that are moving apart, 
at another location, we have other two plates that are moving apart. But look at my hands here and here. In the middle, I do have this and this that are actually colliding. Okay? If they are two continental that at some locations are colliding, it's what's happening underneath, uh, between the India and the Eurasia. They are colliding. They are about the same material, rocky material. So formation of high mountains. Okay? Like even the Dolomites, the Alps. Uh, I think a little bit older. Yes, yes, and uh, also and the Dolomites. Now they're up there, but we can find a lot of marine fossils because they were uh, below the sea level. Mm -hmm. Yes, marine fossils, marine fossils, not just fossils, marine fossils. It's amazing, right? And so this grow grows up. But we could have also situations, so those are constructive um, uh, margins in which we do have convergent margins, in which we do have the formation of rising up of uh, the, because the two materials are quite similar in terms of their density, so they just grow. But if we do have some material in some other places in which they interact, what happens is this, this abduction. So one sinks underneath the other, okay? In sinking underneath the others, part of this crust reaches the mantle again, in which it's very hot, it melts, and crust gets recycled. But also this melting and this pointing is actually creating volcanic chains on top, okay? Because some magma is rising up and coming over here, okay? This is the formations, let's say, of the Aeolian Islands that are in front of Sicily, okay? The Aeolian Islands, those are volcanic rocks and are the results of a situation like this, in which we do have a subduction going going on underneath Italy, southern Italy, and here this, this is melting, rising up, and creating the volcanic islands. It's more place in some places they are um, rising up, and some others are subsiding. But overall, the big mechanism, because then, we do have a lot of um, little movements as well, uh, and, le and regional and local conditions. But uh, besides, if we don't consider this on a first approximation at a larger scale, everything is due because Africa is pushing against the origin. Yes, there is an uplift what we call an uplift of uh, some portions. Yes, because those are interacting. So basically, if one plate is interacting with another, I make noise. This noise, that's what an earthquake actually is. There is much energy. Yes, because the more active it's, and uh, all the earthquakes are always in these margins, on the margins. Someone at the beginning was asking about uh, Hawaii. Hawaii are volcanic islands, but actually are forming because of a different phenomenon. Hawaii are formed what we call an hot spot. So there is always a continuous and steady rising up of magma and the Hawaii that are here, this hotspot, is actually always fixed. 
Okay, we don't tap into the Hawaii, like we said, let's say, in the case of the Eonian Islands. We do have the interaction between two places, there is abduction, lava coming out. In here, there is no collisions and nothing. Let's see why this is happening. And just give me one sec. Why this is happening? Because we do have this constant rising up of Mount Gama, what we call it hot spot, okay? Which is steady, fixed, is there. And on top, there is the plate, in this particular case, the Pacific plate. So we do have the formation of the, vol of the volcanoes, let's call it, is this, this one? That is because of the magma and the feeding system by the hot spot. But the plate, the Pacific plate, is actually moving in one particular direction, which is the one that you see on average in, uh, depicted with this arrow here. So the plate is moving, so it means that the feeding point is always there, so it's actually forming a new volcano, a new volcano, a new volcano, and as the plate is moving, the feeding point is always steady. The, just the volcano or the volcano system that is underneath the mantle plume is feeded by the lava going up and adding uh, volcanism, active volcanism. The others are extinguished. Just because the plate has been dragged away and that's what we do have. So we do have this hotspot track, let's say. No, it will be dragged. It will be dragged and moved and moved away. Yes, but that's it's, it's a local, that's uh, something. Like, for example, like in some cases, Yes, up, exactly, and that island is named differently according to whoever wants to take it, and uh, nature likely resolved and said, before they start fighting, let's just dismantle it, and this, and uh, because the British wanted, the Italian wanted, right, you know, it's like a new piece of land, so just dismantle it and let's. <laughs> yes, it happens. <laughs> yes, for now. But there will be one time in which the plate will be dragged away, pushed away, and that volcano will be not active anymore. A new one will be forming instead. Okay? Yes, but that's a different kind of mechanism. Uh, of this one is not because of this, but there are like several, and all of this uh, also we can start even understanding that since the mechanisms are different in terms of the formation, we understand why in some cases we do have a much fluid lava that flows as a river, in some others like a different kind of. Uh, so the environment, the local conditions will play a role even in this particular. Yes. African plate. It's moving upwards rather than like northwise rather than going down. It's maybe yes. <laughs> At a certain point, yes. Yes. And that but that's it's just because of some other uh, it's it's related to this geodynamic process, but actually it's doing like this. In fact, in one part, it's more eroded than the others. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, because what happened that was like the part in between, boom, went down like this. And in fact, the Mala, like in that particular location, is what we call the Mala 
fold and that went down uh, a bit. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, what happens is that uh, once we do have